Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 64. Dividend aristocrats that nobody talks about. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. This week we have a jam-packed show for you. We're going to talk a little bit about four companies that nobody really talks about uh, in the dividend aristocrat land. We're going to talk some news of the week. We have lots of questions from our community and we're going to do some portfolio reviews as well. So stay tuned. If you if you haven't already done so, please like us on YouTube, Spotify and any channel that you're listening on. And we will see you on the inside. G European DJ, what are we going to do tonight? The same thing we do every Friday, EMF. Talk about dividends and take over the world. <laughs> I really like that that image that you put up on Twitter the other day. I think it was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with Pinky in the brain, right? Uh, and I really loved it. And it's not to say that you're stupid or that I'm uh, looking depressed, but, uh, you know, I, I, it's always the same right during the week. Like, uh, it's either you or me asking, like, gee, what are we going to talk about this week? Yeah, and, and uh, usually it's last minute too. As well. It's like Thursday night. We're like, oh, we have to prep for tomorrow. So, yeah, no, it's very, nice yeah, one. Very funny. Very funny. So, let's talk about some Apple. I think they're big in the news. You're a shareholder you you i know we we talk a lot about apple on this show what are your thoughts about this this new ruling that's going to make him go bankrupt uh well you know um i i'm not surprised yeah let's say like that when companies become so big you get this monopolistic behavior you get lawsuits google has the same and i think governments are typically you know uh favoring also sometimes the small guys in this case epic games uh epic games has the money to have a good uh, lawyer and now they uh, got a f favorable ruling here i would say but i think we owe it to our listeners to put it a bit in perspective so um if you think about what apple earned i believe in the last quarter it was 81 billion 63 billion of that came out of products uh, service uh, this is not the service category so it's 17 billion in services which means that a part of that is at risk let's say maybe 10 15 percent um if that is at risk their uh, quarterly growth rate in revenue increase is higher than the money that's at risk that's how i look at this so um, long term of course it might open up the door for more um, these kinds of things right uh, monopolistic uh, charges uh, via courts and also other companies like facebook or, or google i think this might set a precedence for others also to take the courage to start uh, going to court we have we had of course a chip war between qualcomm and apple as well uh, a few years ago where they in the end settled um so yeah i think this is this is the thing when you're so popular and so big and you have these kind of lock-ins right because they can say whatever they want these are lock-ins and nobody likes lock-ins customers neither um of course they can get a long time away with premium products but i'm not surprised that this happens as such uh but from a revenue point of view i'm not concerned uh, at all so uh, i don't expect uh, the price to to react that strongly and if it does it i think it's buying opportunity yeah but come on apple were taking taking the, the mickey as we say over here a little bit 30 percent on revenue just to use their their payment process i mean it's it's too much money they could have just done a, a regular fee maybe five ten percent or whatever the norm is and nobody might have complained but taking a huge chunk of somebody else's revenue just to provide a service a payment provider i think it's I think they're shooting themselves in the foot, really. Well, it's capitalism, and if they would have done over all those year, years 5%, they would have probably had less revenue. So it's, it's just, I, I think they probably uh, they have a, an analyst there that puts it in an Excel sheet or a Google sheet, whatever they prefer, and then they just probably calculate. And if they are smart, they also take uh, the risk assessment in it of litigation cases. And 
Oh, come on. I, I'm an engineer. Like, these people that sit there in spreadsheets and make forecasts, I mean, it's bullshit. Like, it's easy to put stuff into a, a, a spreadsheet and make it sound rosy and pretty. But, I mean, 30% is is a lot of money. How can they possibly think long term this is the right thing to do? Companies are, are, are clearly not going to like this. Obviously, Epic Games, they're big enough that they could fight this. Um, but as you said, it's going to be a landslide now. And, and, and whatever 30% people will... 100% move to a cheaper option. Why wouldn't they? So the, If the, they can, yeah. If they can. Uh, well, they, they can. Yeah. The ruling says they can, so. Yeah. They, they will. Well, let's see. I don't think it uh, will impact Apple in, in material materially if you think also the revenue growth um, that's pushing this company up. So it will be a blip on the radar, I think. But fundamentally, it means a big thing, yeah, because it sets a precedent and also maybe for other services, for maybe even for products where it's monopolistic. Because if you go for Apple, you know, it's even uh, they take away your, uh, what is it, the, 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 the socket for your uh, earphone and they make the USB charger and you need to pay extra and $250 uh, for those butt plugs in your ears. So it's... Uh, you know, th this is Apple, but we know it, and people love it. Yeah. yeah. So, but, well, I, I must say that the the court did rule against Epic and say that they could not demonstrate that Apple were operating an illegal monopoly. So, from that yeah. point of it, they they couldn't prove that. But, but as you said, it is setting a dangerous precedent, and who knows where where it'll stop. But I mean, look, I, I I'm not an Apple shareholder, so I, I honestly it, it doesn't bother me if the price drops, but I think it's only fair that Epic won won this battle. Um, Apple yeah. make enough money; they have enough money in other in other jurisdictions that no need to to beat up the little guy. I suppose so. No fair exactly. play to fair play to uh, Epic Games. Yeah, well, and I'm an Apple shareholder. Full disclosure, but I I bought once few shares, and they just uh, went four or five times more over time, so it became a large position. But to be honest, I'm not so focused even on Apple in my portfolio. It's a really low yield there. It's just on price appreciation is there, but I don't intend to sell it uh, anytime soon. It's just a well-run company with uh, Tim Cook. And uh, for for this, I'm not lying awake at all with it. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, uh, what's good before we start with the main topic, I want to actually call out that our Facebook uh, group is quite well growing. I think we had just 150 um followers like just a month ago we are now on 250 followers so many people are uh, joining the facebook group it's not so active yet from a point of view that people are asking their own questions but people are starting to get engaged so if you're interested to also engage with us just join the join the facebook group you will find it by uh, searching for dividend talk uh, then you can just join i think you need to ask two questions so that we keep all the spammers out um, but feel free to join and if you have questions to us you don't need to wait for the show you can just post them directly we will pick them up if they are interesting for the show as well or we answer them directly it's our intention just to make it a community. It's with European flavors, so there are more Europeans in there. So you might even try to ask these nasty text questions to people uh, uh, that nobody always feels 100% comfortable with. Nice, nice. Okay, so we might as well then jump straight into our main topic. We're going to pick a couple of companies each that are dividend aristocrats um, that we like but maybe people don't speak about them as much certainly not in the the twitter land or on facebook so do you want to go first and, and pick your first company that you chose yeah so uh to be clear this is a european aristocrat <laughs> so i'm choosing coloplast so coloplast is such a company that i'm often looking at but it always feels expensive and it is expensive. So it's not, um, I said, something that I'm currently considering to buy, that to be clear. But I think this is such a company that could be on many people's radar for when the time is uh, there to pull the trigger. So Coloplast is almost already like the name suggests. It's a lot about plasters, but then on industry, wide industry scale. So um, it just uh, manufactures, um, how you say it? These medical devices and 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 services for for wound wound care. I don't know how you say it in English for wounds, um, but if you're ever in hospital and they put these big uh, uh, plasters on you, it might be from Coloplast. Let's say it like that. 
Yeah, you're laughing at me, but I, I'm struggling with my English here. It, it sounded like Harry Potter when you're saying wands. <laughs> wands yeah. So how do you say it in the English? Uh, wound. Wound. Okay, yeah, so wound. these are blasters for wounds. And the company's really, really uh, big. It's currently making 19 billion um, in revenue. And uh, just in 2014, it was still making 14 billion in revenue. So it's growing quite quite steadily and even rapidly, I, I, I would say. They have currently a dividend growth streak of 28 years. The share price is around 1,100 Danish crowns at the moment. So it's a, it's a Danish company. Um, the yield is 1.6%. So it's not a high yielder. And it also, or one of the main reasons is because the, their price to earnings, the forward price to earnings is around 45 so this also tells you a lot that the company is overvalued, in my opinion, by these metrics. But it has to do a little bit with their growth and their potential um, as well. The 10-year dividend growth rate is more than 20% on an annualized basis. So that's really a fast grower. And the last year, the dividend growth rate was 6% because it slowed down a little bit. The forward payout ratio is currently 74%. Percent. I just love this company. It's one of those companies, if you would... Um, do a back test on the Noble 30 index. It's the highest performer, uh, both in price appreciation and in dividend growth. So they had an amazing, amazing uh, decade or 20 years even behind them. And I don't see them necessarily stopping. They're still expanding quite a lot. Of course, their growth has slowed down a little bit, but it's still growing. So I love this as, as a company. I just don't like it as a stock at where it trades now. It would literally need to uh, drop 40% or something like that for me to become interested in this company. But I think it's a company that we never hear about. I don't know whether it is because people mainly look at the yields and that it doesn't pop up on screeners. But as a company, it's a great company. Um, and again, a Danish company, again, in the healthcare industry like Novo Nordisk uh, as an example. So it's really interesting, this one for me. Yeah, I've seen this company. And the reason why it doesn't show up much for me is the currency um i, I tend to look at, at euro and it's what it kind of throws me off swedish and danish companies as well because you're looking at different currencies in both um and the conversion rates and, and such so i already have exposure to to the us dollars and putting more currency in and trying to track that mm -hmm. is an actual nightmare for for me so yeah that's that's probably one of the reasons why and and, and as you said it it what PE ratio 45 it's it's it, I'm never going to buy something like that but no. in terms of moat and, and and what they do I'm, I'm well aware I wrote an article about uh, the top I think it was the top 10 or 15 dividend European dividend aristocrats that's been featured on a lot of a lot of big sites but they were I think my second or third, third pick on that so no. I, it's a company that I really like like you but uh, it's it's the currency conversion that that gets me yeah no fair fair enough so that was mine, the first one. How about yours? I am going to pick one, and I think that the kind of capitalist might like this because he's been beating the, this company, um, beating the horn quite a bit lately, which is AR Products and Chemicals, which is ticker APD. Um, so for those that don't know, obviously, the, the key is in the name, what they do. So they're the world's largest producer of atmospheric and processed gases. They serve lots of businesses in industrial, technology, energy, material, nearly all sectors. So they, they serve pretty much every sector. And the three main business units are industrial gases, America industrial gases, which is the same only in America. And they are also have the Asia branch of that as well. So pretty much any industrial gas, these guys are, are on top of it. What I do like about these, I, first of all, they have a 39 streak history of dividend increases but the last dividend increase was 11.9 percent like like you i suppose all these companies are quality companies and maybe one of the reasons why they're not spoken about a lot is because of how expensive they always seem and um, typically this company always seems seems expensive so i think that for the last five or six years their average p ratio would be mid to mid to low 20s which is which is quite high if you go back as far as maybe 2011 and 12 it was about 15 or 16 but since then they've always been in the high 20s and right now 
the, the PE ratio is about 30. So again, quite expensive for, for what you're buying. But what you get with this company is you're getting a company that is focused on one area. I believe that the competitive advantage is that it's just that like it's very hard to switch from a company like that. So once once you have this in, the switching costs are high and it's not easy to find a similar company in your area to, to get what you need. So I love companies like that. As soon as, soon as you're locked in, it's almost like a lifetime contract. You're not going to switch too easily. Um, so it, it, it is a clear winner for me. The returns, including dividend and share appreciation over the last six, seven years has been phenomenal. You're looking at at least 10 to 15% returns every year. So from those looking from a, a growth capital appreciation or total return point of view, they are very, very strong. Um, well, what have I missed? The, the dividend yield at the minute is it's quite attractive, actually. It's it's 2.23. It's not the, the highest yield, um, but I suppose it's that valuation for me, which which is which is a killer. But I, I think they're a quality company. They have a moat that it's it's hard to replicate. You can't disrupt that industry too easy. So if you're looking for a company that is probably going to be around in the next 30 years, I, I, I wouldn't look past this company. Yeah, nice one. It's a uh, it's actually a company that tracks me. Um, I just don't have necessarily place for this company in my portfolio right now. But it's probably something I need to look another time into it because even though the yield is not high, it just needs to drop twenty percent and meets my meets my criteria, right? And mm -hmm. for these high quality companies, it's worth to spend some additional time to uh, on it to check if I really want it in my portfolio and be ready for the, when the price drops. It's a nice pick. Yeah, and and they're also uh, I didn't mention this, but they're also trying to get involved in this green like green conversion, and so they I think they have a joint venture now with ACWA. I must check that, but ACWA Power, um, which are trying to drive this green energy and and obviously mm. green gases. So, um, if anyone's looking to get involved in this carbon free uh, world yeah. that we're we're trying to go but towards this is not a bad point we've got a proven company that that makes a lot of money um, and yeah. that will be around so that's another way to get exposure into that industry cool nice one so i then um uh, let me take the next one and it is also an american company now it's uh, called polaris and it's a manufacturer of motorcycles and snowmobiles uh, that's what most people know it uh, from and i find this company quite quite interesting as such because you know usually i'm not so interested in car manufacturers but how i look at these are more like luxury goods for people um that maybe live in a, a bit less urban areas more more in the outskirts where you know where you, like, like where i live it's cool to go with your mountain bike through the forest or something like that and, th and this kind of equipment is perfect for that and I think um, as, as those areas also might get wealthier in some in some um, in some regions of the world, I think this is what one of those secular growth trends is for a company uh, like this. Now, you can imagine in the beginning of the pandemic, they had a quite tough time, of course, with sales because people had other things to worry about. They couldn't even go outside. But since then, it has been picking up uh, quite well again. Uh, although, if you look at the whole of 2020, their sales were actually quite good um, because, you know, people probably uh, used their, um, I said, the money they got from the American government to uh, buy some of this kind of uh, equipment, yeah, if, if they didn't need it uh, for themselves. So sales was good last year, but um, I think it's fair to compare this company rather with the 2019 sales and take some of the 2020 sales as a one-off from that point of view. And if you look at that, it's nicely growing, I would say, if you take out this hike. Um, they have a dividend growth of 26 years. Um, the share price is around $120 at the moment. It is not the biggest company. It has a market cap around $7 billion. I wouldn't even know how you can make a $100 billion company out of this uh, unless you wait 30 years for inflation. Um, the yield is currently at around 2%, 2.10, but it trades at a low uh, price to earnings around 12 because it had, at, I think, like four or five years ago, it was still trading around, uh, sorry, uh, having a net 
an earnings per share of around five six dollars and now it is around ten dollars earnings per share so quite some growth in uh, net income if you look at it uh, 10 year dividend growth of 11 percent uh, annualized and the last year 1.63 and i think that to a lot to do with the pandemic a more conservative growth but the forward payout ratio will be around 30 percent going forward so the company is called polaris and the ticker symbol is pii i repeat pii and yeah i find this an interesting company um, not something that i will probably purchase but this is also one of those companies that often pops up on my screeners that i looked in ser into several times and i actually never hear anyone talking about Although I think their business model is quite solid and I think that um, they will still have lots of sales going forward. I think there are just many people passionate about these kinds of vehicles um, and specifically in the areas that are just growing in wealth. Toys for boys. And that's what Toys they sell. Toys for boys. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, there's, there's obviously a huge market for that, not on this side of the Atlantic in Ireland, but I, I could imagine Canada... And, and as you said, exactly parts of America would, would do quite well in this. No, nice, nice company. I, not one that I've I've actually heard of really. Um, so nice, nice pick. So what's your last uh, the last one? Which one have you chosen? So the, the last one actually, I, I'm quite surprised that I don't hear more about because when I started looking into this, uh, I think two two days ago, these propped up straight away, and I can't believe I've never looked at them before. And that's Stanley. Black and Decker, so ticker S W K. Um, I mean, when you think of power tools, there's a few companies that that spring to mind for me, at least, would be um, Bosch would be one, but but Black and Decker are are definitely up there as as one of these. They are the dividend king, so they've been paying dividends or increasing dividends for 54 years, and the last increase was still a whopping 13. percent I mean, that's incredible. You would have, <laughs> I would have expected the growth to to slow down. The one caveat I have with this company is that they are certainly not recession proof. So if we have some sort of crash, um, if we have some sort of bubble bursting, I would expect this company to perform horribly like it did in 2007, 2008. But since then, it has recovered. I mean, earnings per share back in 2011 was 524. It's now over double that at 1150. So they've been increasing it absolutely perfectly every year after the recession um but like we said if we're with these high valuations and we expect in markets to crash maybe they're not such a such a good option in terms of their own valuation i actually think they are quite attractively valued at the minute so they typically trade around 15 to 16 pe which is what they're at now so they they are they're keeping keeping in line dividend per share has grown from 164 in 2011 the 316 now i mean that's that's incredible that's i think that's about eight percent annually maybe um well, what else have it to say their dividend yield is 2.2.3 uh, 1.69 percent actually which is quite low for me generally um but their growth rate more than makes up for that um so i think look i think they're a quality company they, they make really good tools it's used all over the world i would just be worried about maybe inflation costs and if there was a recession how, how this company would hold and if if we were in a recession or if we were in that and they drop significantly i probably have no problem in buying them then maybe not so much now but i'm keeping them on my watch list yeah it's it's a nice company and i must say it does pop up from time to time but not so much in the european community and and to your point it's a bit awkward but they have a, a really strong brand power in my opinion mm. i mean uh, black and decker i think everyone knows this brand also in europe and 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 probably people have this stuff in their home over yeah, in I, europe as well i i i mean as as i was a tradesman before so i would i wouldn't see these as a premium brand so if i was buying stuff as as an electrician as i was mm. i would not buy black and decker but yeah. if i'm when i'm buying stuff when i want to build something in my house i build this desk exactly. or exactly. I, I buy black and decker it's um, a consumer product yes they make they make really good tools maybe not professional quality but definitely mm -hmm. for 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 the home enthusiast yeah nice one 
Well, you know, with these four stocks, I hope we uh, inspired you a little bit uh, also with a different angle to um, some of the dividend aristocrats. I think it's it's always good to keep an eye on these, also to diversify yourself a little bit sometimes in your thinking to see what's out there more uh, instead of only talking about Johnson & Johnson, Unilever and, and, and these kind of major companies. So, yeah, good ones. Okay, so let's go to our next topic of today. It's the portfolio review. And today we got uh, the portfolio submitted from Piotr. Hi, Piotr. I met actually Piotr the other day, uh, this summer. Uh, he lives over here in Warsaw. We went for a drink. It's so cool that uh, the country was a little bit open this summer. Let's see how it's going forward with the fourth wave. Um, but it's also nice to see his portfolio coming in as a submission. Now, what does he own? And he's quite concentrated maybe in, in his top five. He has Unilever at 12.5%. He's got PZU, which is a Polish uh, bank slash insurance slash healthcare company for 12.4% allocation. He's got British American Tobacco at 7% allocation. Ahol Del Heze at 5% allocation and Rio Tinto at 5% allocation. This is his portfolio, and his idea is to have a defensive one that, that he can sleep well at night. And he's still in the accumulation phase. And what I also understood when, when we went for a drink together, uh, he's still in the early days when it comes to um, not, have, not being able to put all the money in that as he would like to, because he still needs to work on his savings rate. So from that point of view, his thinking is, if I got high yielders now, and these companies have all, all uh, this average of these companies probably around the 6 7% yield uh, in these top five, uh, his idea is that take the most dividends now to reinvest so that my snowball gets quicker, bigger. So that's the thinking uh, here behind it. Instead of focusing on low yields, stashing a lot of money in it, and hardly seeing the impact of the the snowball in the beginning of the size of the snowball so that's the thinking here and yet yeah, um, his question is to 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 yeah share our thoughts about it yeah and and i mean when i when i saw it first um i was thinking wow <laughs> um i i didn't know that the polish insurance company first of all um but eight percent dividend dividend yield is quite high it is as you said quite concentrated i think nearly 40 percent of his portfolio is made up of these five stocks at the moment but it is important that he is in the accumulation stage and that is going to happen if you're going to buy uh, particularly look, i don't know how much he does but if he buys monthly if he buys even quarterly you're going to see huge fluctuations i, I see that in my own portfolio uh, one of the criticisms that we get as as dividend investors and i see a lot of from other types of investors is that we can get focused on yield high yield usually when there's high yield we know that there's a reason for it and it, it is quite risky so i understand the approach i understand why you would want to choose your high yielders now but you have that added risk of of a cut and we've seen that with, with royal dutch shell for example um we have a a, a bank here i mean european banks are, are not do you mean they are they are liable to cut dividends as well, so it it could it could happen. It it is a risk, so I would just be careful. I would just be careful with that. Just be aware of it. I'm not saying it's it's a bad thing or a good thing, but you do have that added risk there. I understand why he he goes this road road, but maybe I would maybe mix it up a, a little bit more. But I look. I think it, I think it's it's a good top five. I have one, two, three of them. Three three of them in my own portfolio. So. I can't criticize that too much. And I know I know Rio Tinto, maybe you might speak a little bit later. So no, I, I, I think I think it's good. I think it's a, a good plan. I, um, he has 21 in his portfolio now. I don't know what they're like, but maybe start beefing those up a little bit more to even out the, the portfolio spread. Yeah, I've got similar thoughts here. So first of all, I think that if we look at Unilever, British American Tobacco and Ahold, div these dividends are really safe, in my opinion. Of course, you don't know ever what with a company happens, but if they don't do fraud, these are slow compounders. They, you know, it's not like everyone stops smoking tomorrow. Uh, the same with Unilever, the same with Ahold. So these are slow compounders and they will also slowly decline uh, under normal circumstances. So only fraud or something like that or a legal lawsuit 
would uh, would take those down. So I'm not worried about those three at all. I think with PZU, it's it, they you know they don't necessarily have consistent dividend growth. So you're in here at, for the yield, the same with Rio Tinto. Um, they, they pay bonus dividends, so that's why the dividends are also, also quite high. But you have a floor in it, and this and this floor is still high. So they rather pay out a share, um, a percentage per share. So it's, I don't consider them necessarily dividend growth companies. But over the last decade, they have been growing. But I think that's also more because of the, um, the, the how I said, the bull market we live in. Um, I understand what Piotr is doing. I would say now, once you have this course set up, also knowing of 21 stocks, there's a part of the snowball which is also important, and that's dividend growth. And if you look at most of these companies, I don't expect uh, more than 6% on average on these five dividend growth going forward. Yeah? And it's an equal uh, important factor when you think about uh, dividend reinvesting. So I think Ahold qualifies for this kind of uh, growth rate, probably British American Tobacco. The other three, I don't really see them hitting the numbers, um, specifically also not if we will have some market uh, headwinds. So from that point of view, I would start looking maybe at around the 3% yield, 2.75% yield with companies that might have more like... Uh, I say it's something around 8% dividend growth going forward to, to mix a little bit up because you will also need to benefit from that point, point of view from the snowball. But I think this is a really good start with the high yields um, as long um, as Piotr is aware that it might slow down later maybe some of the uh, dividend growth from that point of view. Yeah, there's a dividend wave have a one page going around with high dividend yield and a low dividend yield but high dividend growth and, and compare and you can see that the dividend growth really it takes longer but when it when it overtakes the high yielders it, it really snowballs um certainly yeah. check that out well actually what i what i'd love to know here is how you plan to average down the yield with dividend growers i i'd love to know how you plan to do that is, is that by selling parts of the high yielders or adding extra capital but um, i would i would love to know just personally i'd love to know that from from myself because yeah. that that's to me that's very interesting a very interesting approach yeah okay good so uh thanks Piotr. i hope this helps uh let us know uh what you think as well you know where to find us on facebook or twitter and yeah let's go to some of the listeners questions cool um so i'll ask the first one from casper uh Kornack. And he has asked us, stop laughing, I probably pronounced that wrong, but he has asked us, do we think a market crash is happening soon? Um, given the fact that Yellen warned about possible October default, bad unemployment data, and some banks downgrading US equities. Uh, I have no clue uh, if a market crash will happen soon. I think it's. I think that it would happen soon already since 2014. Yeah, what we're on episode sixty-four, I, I believe since episode two, maybe I've been saying I'm expecting a crash. So maybe when I say we don't, we're not going to have a crash. It might actually crash. But I mean, look, I, I think we made no secret, or at least I have, that the valuations are too high. Uh, the pandemic uh, covered a lot. There was handouts given by governments. The Fed has been printing. That all has to come to a head at some point. We don't know when. We don't know what the trigger will be. Um, we can't possibly say it's going to be October for certain. We we don't know. All we know is that something will happen. How bad it'll yeah. be, nobody knows. But we'll just keep keep chugging along and see see how we go. But so for me, the more interesting question is, what if it happens? What will you do? Um, I spent all my money on a car there. <laughs> last last week so i'll be quite disappointed if it happens soon it's going to take me a couple of months to build back up my war chest um but i'll just i just keep going the way i'm going i'm, I'm just still going yeah, but to that's the thing money. right uh, because i would i would not sell a share in my portfolio unless no. there are dividend cuts so for me if a market crash happens um it doesn't really matter actually i would get excited that would be like uh, pop up the champagne and uh, get the get some additional money at work well, I wanted to wait at least six months until I build up my my war chest again. But yeah. like you, I, I won't sell. And a, div a dividend cut doesn't mean I'm going to sell either. 
it depends no but there's a high likelihood right if the fundamentals changed with that uh, like like disney did right disney at the time said guys we're not you're not going to see it soon we need to invest it yeah then the whole the whole investment fees is uh changes yeah but we'll 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 cross those bridges when we come but certainly i won't be selling just because of the crash so no Okay, then uh, Ritz Wildevank uh, asked on Facebook, uh, he would love to hear your opinion about the upcoming Schold Energy IPO. So it's a Dutch energy company, uh, kind of a play on on on, on the green stuff, uh, the green yeah, trend. So, so I, I didn't know much about this company until I saw this question. Um, first thing I did, went on to the website, website looked okay, went on to the investors relation page, which is which is I always do. And I got nothing. It was blank. It was just a footer and nothing else. I asked you to do the same. You got the exact same as me. And honestly, that really pisses me off. I I just, I mean, it's a simple thing these days as investors. You want to get the data easy. And I just don't, I don't understand it. But in terms of what the company are trying to do, they seem to be in this green transition. Look, it looks great. I'm not really into IPOs or into new companies like that. I would much rather go with a company such as, I don't know, maybe Encavis, um, which was recommended by a guest on our show before her also in that space, but they are a, a more mature company in that area. So um, I am more than happy with companies coming in and, and paying, what, an 80, 80% dividend pay ratio, we're saying, but for me, they'd still be too new a company for me to to look at yeah same here okay so the next question is from dividend dane and he says uh, that we have seen a slow and gradually receding market these past couple of weeks and september is typically a worst performing month so taking those two uh two two things in uh, consideration should we put a break on just buying as usual and wait for an opportunity (laughs) <laughs> so I, I i love this when it's september is the worst performing month and in in the dividend day chat everybody was speaking about how often they they check the portfolios and i mean i never che- i never i don't really check you you said yeah. to me before the show that the markets are down and the first thing i said is oh are they because I, I honestly yeah. i don't I don't bother checking I, I don't need to check that's why i'm a dividend investor so if september is traditionally the worst performing month mm, for me, that's probably a good time to buy <laughs> if things are. Oh dropping. yeah, we buy every any anyway every month, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah I've I've the same. Um, it's, it's what is it? Uh, sell and may and go away, but remember to come back in September. And then now now they tell me that once you come back and you initiate your portfolio, you even get the worst month uh, straight on it. Why why isn't it called like come and remember come back in October? <laughs> hey just just skip october why, why not go to december or wait yeah christmas? december yeah yeah but in december you have the tax harvesting right so <laughs> yes. then you get that again so and then in uh in in january and february you you also get this this down t- time so it, it's like yeah it makes all no sense for you for me it's the same like you i i don't check my portfolio a lot often i also get surprised that markets are down uh, I made the joke in the dividend day chat that usually I'm aware of uh, sudden price drops because they start pinging there and I, I like to be engaged on Twitter. So that's why I know. Other than that, I wouldn't also really know. So dividend day, um, yeah. Uh, suck it up with this answer, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Next one is uh, Chago, also one uh, from the dividend day chat. So how much of an impact do the macroeconomic factors have on your willingness to invest in a company? Are you not concerned that lagging European economies will drag the performance of European companies, making non-European companies more attractive? This this is like a question that you would ask a professional investor, isn't it? Someone that 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 their job is investments and they look at all these all these macroeconomics and honestly, that is so far out of my league. It's it's not even funny. I'm a small dividend investor. I look at cash flow i look at earnings and that's about it I, so I read the news and i don't pay too much more attention than that so for me yes we we know the valuations are different we we know the valuations are the returns are a lot less in european companies than american companies but we look at dividends and that's where our, our money our cash flow is coming from 
and my average yield from US companies is not too much more than European companies at the moment. So I don't pay too much attention to, to macroeconomics or anything like that. So the problem that I have with the, the, the suggestion in, in this question is the simple fact, if I look at Unilever or if I look at Ahold, yeah, two big positions in my uh, portfolio, even Danone, you know, yeah. they get most of their, uh, so Ahold, 65% of revenue from the US. Danone, majority outside of Europe. Um, I said also um, Unilever, majority outside of Europe. So, you know, with these kinds of global companies, <laughs> It's the same as having kind of a world index, yeah? Specifically, they are consumer stable. So the only risk you have here is that, for instance, um, the local governance, governance uh, put, for instance, a higher tax rate on it, which uh, suppresses the earnings. But I don't really look at it from the macroeconomic factors. I look at, at it more from a political point of view, where China is controlled by the government, where, where companies work for the government. In in um, how is it in America? Uh, politicians work for the companies, and in Europe, it's a bit a mix of those both. That's how I look at it. So, if you buy companies that are of global nature in Europe, you don't have this impact. You might have this impact with uh, Venovia, which is a, a local uh, real estate play. So, uh, not too much worried about it from my point of view. And also, the last that I want to say about it. It's not a stock market. It's a market of stocks. So certain companies have their own tailwinds, their own secular growth trends. Think about, um, I said, um, uh, ATN payment processing. I know it's not a dividend company, but all the, such companies, they have tailwinds. And there are many of such European companies. Then we, we just spoke about Coloplast, right, as an example. So it's... It's a market of stocks, not a stock market. That's how I look at it. And that's why I don't need to be bothered about economic factors and such either. But that's that's how I think about this whole topic. Because I think he has a point that if you look at the indexes, probably the US will keep outperforming uh, Europe. Also because U US finds um, corporate growth more important than um, population uh, wealth growth. And and look, I must I must say we we've spoken to Tiago quite a few times. I read all his articles on his on his Substack, which are I mean you know they're all really really detailed, yeah. really yeah. detailed. So I'm I'm not surprised by this question and and his knowledge and education in business and it's, finance yeah, far sar, far superior to mine. Yeah, um, I just like to keep things simple and <laughs> simple, same here, simple as possible. Yeah. Next one then from Life with Dividends. Uh, and by the way, he has a nice blog. He didn't start too long ago. So I recommend uh, Googling him and, and, and check him out. Um, and he writes, by the way, some really good articles. And he asks, in your journey as an investor so far, name one investment decision that has turned out to be great and one that has turned out to be worse. What have you learned from this experience? Yeah, that's easy for me. So one that's worked so far is Walgreens. And one that was not so good was Tangar. Um, have I learned? Yes. So know what you buy and why you're buying it and why you're going to sell it as well. So so Tangar turned out to be a disaster. I bought it at a high price. I sold it at a low price and it returned to an even higher price. So, I mean, look, it, it was a mistake from, from my point. I probably should never have bought it in the first place. Um, and Walgreens, I think I might have just got lucky. So. <laughs> So I'll share you then what's really uh, happened with me. So my best one is Microsoft and my worst one is General Electric. Mm -hmm. And um, what have I learned from this experience that I'm even more confused? Because I, I in both, I made a bet on the CEO. So with such an Adela, I felt like, okay, he's it. He's going to uh, push this company into the sky and I and I was probably uh, quite naive, but I even fell for the words of uh, Jeff Immelt, who was just a charlatan and he should have been in jail uh, already by now. So what I learned with it is probably how to spot a CEO better. I made the same same mistake with Rick Goings from Tupperware. I don't make those mistakes so easily anymore because I started to to see the window dressing and 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 look at the financial data and the non-adjusted terms more, and then you can quickly uh, see if a CEO is uh, 
just uh, smooth talking or not. So that's why you're a fan of Arvind Krishna. IBM? No, no, neither. No, IBM. No, don't stay away. Okay. Okay. On to Phil's question. Um, so Phil is asked us, "What do you think about the DAX extension from thirty to forty companies?" Um, not a lot. It's uh, if they need it, then that's fine. I mean, it's an index. Uh, like I like I just earlier said, it's not a stock market, but market of stocks. So if if there comes some more news or more, if these companies get a bit more in the spotlights, then that nice. It might trigger me to look easier or earlier into it. But for the rest, it doesn't do anything for me. I I can imagine that maybe um, if you're from Germany, that you might feel more pride or something like that around this, because I think Thiago that we just spoke about wrote a really nice article on the European Investor Network about. Uh, the PSI index from Portugal, how how it yeah. came to a standstill, and uh, they even dropped the name of the PSI twenty because they don't have twenty stocks anymore. This is not nice. Yeah, you would love your country and your your corporates to do well. I think specifically if you have passion for economy. So I can imagine that this is really nice uh, uh, for German citizens, but I don't have that attachment to the German index. Uh, it would be more if you ask me this question about the Dutch index. That I would have more, more. I said yeah. emotions to it. Yeah, it, it seems like a good thing, though, doesn't it? I mean, they're all pretty well-known companies going up: uh, Airbus, Siemens, Healthineers, Porsche, etc. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how it impacts maybe ETF holders, maybe not of the the DAX, but the the one underneath that, which I think is the MDAX. So mm -hmm. these companies had to come out of somewhere. So they've they've come yeah. from the MDAX. I think they made up a third of that. So mm. how how that affects ETF um, holders might be a little bit different, but um, like you personally, I have no real uh, opinion on that. Only for it, it seems on the surface to be a good thing for for Germany. Yeah. Okay. Then we have a question from John, and he asks, "Are you guys at all following the growth in carbon credit mark carbon credit markets?" I can tell you, no, not at all. I had once a lesson at business school about it. It was so boring and it was so full of manipulation by airlines and everything that I felt like, okay, not interesting for me. I, I understood that I, I saw an article passing by lately that um, it was quite growing again, um, but it's not in my interest. And, and, and John, it's simply because my, my mind is going to dividend growth. I, I can't occupy my mind with all these kinds of topics as well. So good question, but not for me. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I it doesn't it doesn't cross my radar. I, I mean, I'm pinky in this in this podcast. So, if if the brain yeah. doesn't it doesn't comprehend this, then it's it's not going to come to me either. Okay, then um, now you are the brain. <laughs> uh, Miłosz Markovic is asking, what about European banks traps or opportunities? I mean, look, I don't know a whole lot about European banks as a whole. I know about Irish banks, and. Uh, in in what you say bankers are wankers that seems to be the case and and they are 100 percent value traps in in ireland so if if europe which i assume they do follow the same same tone i would i would stay away from from european banks yeah same here and even that i i, I think bankers are wankers um the the it's not about that actually well also but why I really don't want them in my portfolio is because, and we saw that last year during the pandemic, the European Central Bank or what is it, the European institution, they just say, thou shall not pay dividends to your shareholders. Uh, you're, you're a systemic, uh, uh, how's it, uh, bank, so you need to uh, play safe first. So, and I don't want to have a dividend cuts in the financial distress. It's as simple like that. And that's when I need to count on it now, now not now. So that's why it's not an opportunity for me. Cool. And then the last question then is from Vladi Vayner. Um, and this is a really interesting question because I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but he says, when you buy American assets, do you take into account the inheritance taxes for non-US residents? The US imposes a 40% estate tax rate on US assets above 60K dollars exemption threshold on assets of deceased non-residents now I, I i knew i knew about this but i i did not know it was in relation to stocks either yeah 
so uh, the only thing Vladi did with this question is trigger me to look it up be be because now I'm thinking like, oh shit, is yeah, this it was my, true? That was my and reaction. Then, yeah 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 and 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 how does this work also if i have my stocks in a dutch broker or something like that am i shielded off of that or not i have no clue so i need to really check this out so thanks Vladi, for bringing it, it to our attention if you have any link or any information that you could share with us please do so it will be really uh, desired um, i will even tweet it out so that all the listeners um, can read it on twitter and facebook mm. or instagram um, what this is about yes yeah, so so thanks for highlighting for, for some reason when i saw a state tax i have seen something like this come up before um and i just assumed the state taxes with i don't know real estate or some physical assets in in the united states but if it's concerning um as you say, if it's concerning me owning shares in a Dutch broker or or so on, then then it's quite worrying. Or particularly Interactive Brokers, which is a US company. I mean, I know I've made a switch to them recently, but that could that could change again if if something like this drastically impacted yeah. me. Well, not it won't impact me, but it impact my my kids and my family. That would have to deal with it when I'm long gone. Yes, and I think if if it's already difficult for us, <laughs> then imagine what it is for the wife and kids uh, <laughs> to to reclaim the withholding taxes or the inheritance tax. Do, do you know what? Now, now that I say that, that's their problem. I'm I'm happy to keep going the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good husband, happy wife, happy life, right? Okay, so hey, this is the end of the session. I would say usually we do stick stock pick of the week. We already shared four stocks today. Maybe just what I wanted to share to our community for the people that stayed this long, an extra bonus. I just wanted to let you know that I bought some additional Allianz shares today. I also initiated a position in Rio Tinto. I made a video about it last Sunday about some high yield stocks and I liked what I saw about Rio Tinto. And I uh, sold a, an option uh, on Unilever with a strike price of uh, 44 euro and um uh how is it Expir expiry date in uh, november so yeah i'm really happy that prices came a little bit down this week so i could uh, average a little bit down on allianz and yeah i'm really excited actually about rio tinto because it will be now complementing uh, my bhp billeton i've got the two leading uh, companies in the material sector so now at least if one performs or outperforms, I, I have them both. Yeah, it's a, a good strategy. Materials and industrials are, are two segments I need to get my act together on. So maybe I'll check out your video. Super. Okay, so thank you everyone for staying so far with us. Uh, lots of questions, lots of engagements. Uh, we really like it. As you could hear, we cannot answer maybe every question to full extent. Uh, we might not always agree on everything, but uh, that's why this is an opinion uh, podcast and uh, a little bit unsalted, so I hope you don't mind. And for the rest, I just want to thank you as well, EMF, for this great show again. And all the rest, I wish you a great week and up to the next show. Okay, see you next week. <laughs>